yeah, thank you for uh, inviting me and for organizing this. So Nick um, asked me to come along because he'd seen a couple of papers that came out of my PhD a few years ago uh, to do with using um, genetically sterile insects to manage resistance. And the papers were focusing on managing resistance to BT toxins in crops. So this work is a little bit dated. And as I said, I've been working on uh, mosquitoes in the intervening time. So lots of you in this room will have far more up-to-date information than I will. But I'm still, I thought if I just sort of show you what I had with the data there was at the time, and then um, obviously in the questions, we can maybe try and uh, bring it a bit more up-to-date if that's of any help. Okay, so this is a, a tale of two genetic technologies, one of which uh, most of you are very familiar with, so I can skip over this bit quite quickly. It's um, BT crops, so transgenic crops, um, for, my, for the purpose of my model, we were assuming a single toxin, kind of um, not the more complicated uh, pyramiding and stacking that's going on today, but still potentially relevant if you've got two toxins and there's very widespread resistance to one, then th at the broad level, that's not very different to um, some of the features of this model. But so the original idea um, behind the insecticide, uh, behind the resistance management for these was it was a high dose refuge strategy. So the high dose was supposed to mean that only homozygous insects could survive, such a high dose that two copies of any sort of resistance gene would be needed. Um, any, any insects with one copy shouldn't be able to make it on plants. And then the refuge was there as a source of um, susceptible alleles, susceptible insects. So in economic terms, this is a, an intertemporal trade-off for the growers. They're giving up yield now it, by growing a refuge, those plants are going to get damaged more, they get less crop from that area in return for um, more yield in future by prolonging you know, the durability of the toxins in the crop. Um, and so you'll see in a moment we were looking at the possibility of an alternative source of susceptible alleles to see whether a smaller refuge might be argued for. So in the US, um, as you probably know, refuges are, are mandated. There are various different percentages and um, distance requirements and so on. Other countries, some have them mandatory, some have them voluntary. But the, um, the high dose refuge strategy in general is, is quite um, widely adopted. So yeah, you're going to have a few resistant insects surviving on the BT crops. Maybe, <laughs> probably. And uh, we're increasingly seeing reports from the field, I know, of actual resistance rather than the hypothetical what happens if and when it comes. Um, and then susceptible uh, insects, more of them, or more dense, if you like, on the, on the refuge. So the other genetic technology, which perhaps you don't know so much about, is based on uh, an old technique, actually, been around since then, well, it was independently thought of um, in the 1930s and 40s, but it was really put into practice by USDA in the 1950s, the sterile insect technique, SIT. And there are various um, genetics-based variations on this now, and that's, that's the theme behind my work. So they are sterile insects. Now, that's not technically the right term, but everybody uses it. So they do go out and find mates. Um, you know, eggs are fertilized by um, sperm from sterile males. It's just that um, they're not going to develop into adult insects. So they're um, sterile containing dominant lethal damage in the germline. Conventionally done by irradiation, so a high enough dose to make the released insects sterile, carrying a random mix of dominant lethals in the sperm or in the eggs if you're releasing females as well. Or it's done by genetics um, under the, the system that I'm studying. So OK, you know who I am. On my in opening slide, there's a little bit about who I'm working with. So this um, system, there's one called Riddle, which I'll introduce in a moment. It's a genetic version of this, which was developed at the um, University of Oxford and then into a spin-out company called Oxitec. So I'm sort of working in collaboration with them. So they've got genetically engineered dominant lethals, where they're choosing what kind of um, lethal and where it is. So the idea is, compared to irradiation, um, it's more precise, so um, it should be less kind of collateral damage, if you like, less fitness costs to the insect that are being released. 
and it varies from one insect to another how much damage radiation does. So you release males with two copies of a dominant lethal. Uh, have I got a pointer on here? Is that ha, two hands? Okay. So you release males with two copies of a dominant lethal. However, that's been introduced when those mate with wild females the offspring inherit one copy of that dominant lethal and therefore die. So that's the basic idea behind SIT. Uh, if you can release large enough numbers of males for long enough, this has been shown to be very successful against some agricultural pests. So it's sustained inundative releases. There are versions being developed now by other groups uh, with selfish genetic elements which are spreading through a population. Um, but uh, you can ask me about those, but I'm not talking about them in this talk. So that's uh, the basics. You may have spotted a flaw in that description. How are you going to breed and release large numbers of males if they've got dominant lethals? Well, the genetics are, um, have some clever stuff in. They've got a fluorescent marker. They've got all kinds of things. But importantly, they have um, a switch, so it's repressible. So the way this works in practice is they can be reared in the presence of an antidote. It's a dietary antidote that stops that lethal doing its job, just switches it off. Um, and if there's any molecular people, it's um, based on the TET-O system, TET-OFF. So they can breed, whoops, mass rear large numbers of these insects, separate the sexes, ideally release just males into the environment. Um, Conventional SIT with irradiation, most programs can't separate the sexes. There just is no way of doing it on a very large scale. The Mediterranean fruit fly program has uh, a temperature sensitive, lethal built in, um, sex specific, put together by classical genetics. I think it's something like 20 man years of work or something ridiculous. So um, it, it has been done um, without modern genetic engineering, but it's quite hard. And there's studies that show if you release males and females together, they will tend to mostly mate with each other, and rather than the sterile males, if there are no females around, will go and find. So it can be three to five more times effective to release only males. And if we were talking about mosquitoes, also it's only the females that bite, so um, that's a reason not to be releasing females. For some agricultural pests, overposition damage in itself uh, is harmful to the, to the crop, so economically harmful. So there are reasons not to release females. Uh, yeah, so you, enough males for long enough and the population can crash. And this has been done on a huge scale. So New World Screwworm, done by irradiation starting in the 50s, was um, removed from Texas, all the way sort of worked around a rolling program through the southern United States, down through Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, I'll get these in the wrong order, okay, but all those little bits down to the narrow bit, which is Panama, and they now have a program, a barrier, where they're releasing just... Um, I think it's a few miles across of sterile male screwworm to stop reinfestation from South America. So it's been done on a, a continental wide scale. And also, the Medfly, Mediterranean fruit fly facility, is enormous. It's 2.8 billion sterile males per week they can release. That's 20 tons of fly larvae per week at capacity. And they, they spray them out of aircraft, GPS guidance, and so on. So people say, can you do this big enough? Yes. Yes, it definitely can be done on a large scale. So because it's genetic engineering, the clever folks at Oxitec can actually choose what they're doing with um, that so-called dominant lethal. And one of the things they can do is make it female-specific. So female-specific lethality. It's uh, the sort of thing that I had before. You release males with two copies. They release mate with wild females, their female offspring will inherit a dominant lethal that's female specific, so they'll die. The males will inherit and, in an ideal world, not be affected. There may be some small fitness cost, um, although the lab tests are actually showing that they're doing pretty well. But in the models I'm about to show you, we assumed in the males, a, I think, a 0.1 fitness cost. You know, one in 10 don't survive because of um, some transgene effect. So. Uh, the females die, they're the ones who are laying eggs, they're the reproductive potential of the population, so killing those off is good. The males inherit one copy, male progeny, so half of their daughters will die, half of their males will inherit, so there's a bit of a trickle-down effect. 
although obviously killing all your females is a pretty big fitness effect, so it, that's not going to sort of last in the population very long without any sustained releases. <coughs> One nice thing that this does is allow sex separation. So in the last generation before release, you take away the antidote, all the females die off, and if it's an early acting lethality, so eggs or early larvae that are being killed, which is probably what you want for crop pests, um, then you're actually also saving money on not having to sort of use diet for the females and so on. So it's got some nice sort of uh, neat side effects. There are others that I'm, I'm not going to go into. Right. Um, but one thing is that these males are passing on their genes. They're not just passing on a copy of that dominant lethal through their male progeny. Any other genes that are in your released males could be passed on. So if we can make sure those released males are susceptible to something, the toxin in the BT crop, then that is also getting inherited through the male line. And remember, the idea is to release large numbers of these males if you actually want a suppression program, a control program, eliminate the local population maybe. But even at small numbers, it's, it's putting out susceptible alleles into the population. So this brought us back to our question of, could this be used um, to maybe reduce the size of refuge that is needed? So yeah, could this be an alternative source of susceptible alleles? Uh, so that's the idea behind it. And, and then we had um, a couple of papers exploring this with very simple models. So I'm just going to ignore most of the things that David's told us are really important. <laughs> but um, we started off with, it, you know, this is just a proof of principle. I think what you put in your model depends on the question that you're ans asking. What kind of answer do you want? So we started very simple. Could this mass release delay or maybe even reverse the spread of resistance? And so we started off with just a population genetic model, a single closed homogeneous population, random mating, um, a single gene responsible for resistance. Um, the adults are random mating across the whole area, whether it's BT or non-BT plants. The larvae are assumed to spend their whole life on one type of plant, so either with or without the toxin. Um, these are simplifying assumptions, but actually they're not ridiculous for some pests. So for pink bollworm on cotton, there's a small number of cadherin genes that are all related that have been implicated in resistance. Pink bollworm adults will um, move around within a cotton field to mate with each other. The larvae are incredibly lazy. They just, the, the eggs laid in a cotton ball and they munch their way through that one ball and only move around on the plant. You know. So some of these assumptions are not as um, oversimplified as they might sound. Uh, yeah, and so we first of all did a, a sort of basic theoretical model to say, well, what happens there? It, is there, there are some threshold levels for how big a resistance, uh, sorry, a, a refuge you need, depending on the actual fitness costs um, related to the resistant allele and so on. So we worked all that out first, and then we in, uh, expanded the model to include this female lethal riddle releases. So the system that I've just been showing you. Um, this is the, an example of the sort of graph. So actually, this is an example taken from a Carrier and Tabashnik paper where they were looking at the possibilities for delaying or slowing down resistance. So it's just an example where going from a 0.1 resistant allele frequency up to 0.5 in 36 generations. That's the black line is the allele frequency. The dotted line is re um, the resistant phenotype. So we're assuming high dose here. So resistance is recessive because only um, the homozygous res uh, resistant insects can survive. And then we um, modeled a very s simple, a low level riddle release, one per five release ratio. So that's one riddle male for each five males that are in the wild. And we just assumed as the wild ones emerged, that's the riddle adults are released. So it's a proportional release policy, if you like, which um, we can come back to that, that's perhaps not um, that practical, but it allowed us to do it without any population dynamics. We could just look at allele frequencies for the first guess. And the reason we're picking 0.5 is you'll see this in a lot of the models. Um, it's generally it's labelled as like a, a resistance event. When your allele gets to 0.5, stuff starts happening. And in the simple models, that's where the population um, starts picking up again. So th there is a reason for picking 0.5, but we could have picked any arbitrary level as our measure of w when do we get to bad news. Um, so we modelled uh, a whole range of different fitness properties. The, um, what's the survival penalty on BT crops for susceptible, or for each of three genotypes? 
SS, SR and RR, what's the, the relative fitness in the refuge? Because the, in the refuge, resistance could have a fitness cost attached. Um, we looked at different release ratios. We looked at different starting allele frequencies, um, different refuge sizes. So we you know, modeled across the whole range. And so the general measure, I mean, this is a 10% refuge on the left, a 5% refuge on the right. It's a 0.1 allele frequency at the top. So quite common, you'd be able to see that beginning stuff ha starting to happen in the field. And on the bottom, a 0.01 allele frequency, which is probably about detectable if you went out sampling, but you wouldn't necessarily see any action. And generally, the message was a smaller refuge um, is better, is, is, um, sorry, a bigger refuge is better than a smaller refuge, which we know already. Um, a riddle release can indeed slow or even reverse. Um, so with a high enough release ratio, you can reverse the spread, actually tip the system so that the RLL is going to go extinct. Um, if, the, if there's more resistance out there, then it's harder to control. You know, if you catch it later, if you start this program when resistance is spread further, then it needs a, a higher release ratio. So all of this was kind of common sense, but it was nice to see it um, quantified. We said, OK, I know there's mandatory requirements. Somebody at USDA once stood up when I gave a talk on this and said, it's illegal for you to recommend pl farmers to plant a smaller refuge. Right, so I'm not doing that. Ignore the, the law. <laughs> if there's a hype, well, these kind of models were used actually to, to help set those guidelines in the first place, particularly you know, the uh, Tabashnik group, uh, Mike's work, and so on. So uh, yeah, you know, the law follows uh, the research as well. But anyway. If there's a hypothetical minimum refuge, and we can work it out where there's no releases from our simple model, the minimum refuge size that's needed for the resistance allele never to reach 0.5. So it's either going extinct or it may settle at some lower equilibrium um, so it doesn't get to the point where it's causing real problems. Um, how much difference would a riddle release make to that? So these, um, <laughs> very right-handed, here we go. So the, the minimum refuge size for various sort of different fitness levels. So the stronger, and more thick and more joined up the line, the, the more aggressive the resistance. So you have a minimum refuge rest um, when there's no release at all. And as you increase the riddle releases going up the graphs, it's a smaller and smaller refuge size that's required. And similarly for all the different um, starting allele frequencies. Okay. Uh, perhaps a more useful way to look at that was to say, okay, if there's a minimum refuge size, how much of that refuge could be planted to BT instead of being planted as refuge if we did that riddle release? So how much of that minimum refuge could be saved? And now you can see, um, again, these, these are color coded for the starting allele frequencies. These lines all bunched together by color. So the fitness, relative survival of the, the different genotypes on the BT and on the refuge doesn't make very much difference to the results. What makes the difference is how soon you start the program. So what is the allele frequency at the point the riddle releases start going? And even, um, so this black line in here is just implausibly strong resistance. <laughs> I can't remember the, but I had something like 80 or 90% of insects surviving even on the toxin. Um, and it's still, sorry, yeah, that's right, uh, resistant insects, you know, most of them still surviving on the crops. And that black line is still nestled among the green lines. Um, so one of the questions that came up before, you know, what's Im more important to know? It's really hard to measure fitness costs. So <laughs> well, it's a relief to know that actually that's not going to make a huge difference. It's more about how much resistance is out there. So that was our first sort of go, our first um, proof and principle. So yeah, res resistance was mostly seen to be recessive where it had been lab selected. It was pretty rare at the time. There wasn't much in the field. So with those um, kind of assumptions, it looked like Riddle could help. Riddle releases could help have a, a much smaller refuge to achieve an equivalent level of resistance management. So we said, OK, that was very simple. There were some uh, heroic assumptions in there. Let's broaden that out a bit. We want to look at more genetic and ecological scenarios. Um, and also thinking about the fact that releasing those riddle males is not just putting susceptible alleles out. It is actually releasing that dominant lethal. So it is also helping to control the pest. Now, those kind of ratios, like 1 in 5, maybe 1 in 10, 1 in 2, is much, much lower than a typical SIT program, which could be 10 to 1, maybe 40 to 1 for some pests. It depends on their growth rate. Um, but it ought to be having some modest effect on 
the population numbers as well as putting out the resistance. So the idea was it should be helping on both sides. Right, so BT crops, it's a trade-off. Yeah, but for the ri riddle, it's, it's both increasing, it's, sorry, it's both putting out lethal alleles and susceptibility and they're working together. So I wanted to look at the synergy. So we put in some very simple population dynamics. Um, no density dependence, no space, nothing like that. We just said, well, okay, pink ballworm produces, I don't know, eight and a half. Um, ad each adult female will put in something like eight, eight and a half adult females to the next generation if, if there were no density dependence. If they were starting from a really low level, it's approximately ox exponential. So we'll just use that simple model, and at least it will tell us the direction of travel. It's not going to give us any realistic um, predictions. But um, so here we have sort of time along the bottom, and um, the top graph is resistance allele frequency, and the bottom graph is this very crude population dynamics. So with no releases, resistance spreads. Once it hits that 0.5, you get this uptick. Yeah, resistance takes over. Although the BT crops were controlling the population, it was going down, now it's going to go up. Um, obviously, it's not going to go up to infinity, but like I said, direction of travel. Um, with the riddle releases, if we put in a one per two, one male for every two that's out in the wild, that um, was enough with the um, fitness assumptions behind this one as an example to take it um, extinction of the R allele. So the riddle releases are controlling the population. And they're doing it better than the BT crops are because it's the BT crops plus a modest amount of suppression from the riddle releases. Um, one of our reviewers on, on the earlier paper said, well, if you're releasing such low numbers, why don't you just release wild types? Why do they have to be genetically engineered? Like, well, not sure we want to convince farmers that we're going to put fertile females out there, because remember, it's really hard to separate the sexes without the genetics, but OK, we'll model that. So for the wild type here, we're assuming a mixture of males and females, the same proportion, but half and half. Um, so initially on the population, wild type does better uh, am I getting this right? It does better on the uh, resistance management because the susceptible alleles are being inherited through males and females. But it's um, doing worse in terms of population than the, um, just BT crops alone because there are more fertile females. So they're contributing, they're adding to the population a little bit. Um, but again, with this kind of quite low release, we can find circumstances where that also controls the crops, uh, controls the pests, so the crops are, are okay. Um, riddle releases in all circumstances it was always better than BT crops alone it acts in synergy you're getting the good effects the wild type was a bit more dubious because it kind of depended we could find we can make these three lines um, you know kind of change we could give you a lot of different scenarios here so I could show you with really low releases neither wild type nor riddle do enough to the resistance to, to help but you can find a release ratio for example one per five where the wild type Slightly better resistance management means it's controlling the pest, controlling resistance, so it's controlling the pest. And then with the riddle, that wasn't quite enough. It slowed down resistance evolution, but it didn't um, make the allele go extinct. It's still better than just the BT crops alone, slowing things down. Um, OK, so with the population dynamics, uh, it looks like they're acting in synergy. We then knocked off a whole load of other sort of, well, what if questions that we, we didn't get in the first paper. So what if you've already got a real problem in the field, if resistance has become widespread? Now, just planting a big refuge isn't going to help um, get rid of that. It, it, if there are fitness costs, it will help to uh, try and slow the spread. But with the riddle releases, we figured you could actually do a cleanup job, if you like. So part of a remedial action plan might be a riddle release. So this is an example where we've allowed it, in theory, to get up to 0.6 allele frequency. So it's on its way up to um, fixation. A 10 to 1 riddle release, so now a higher release, much more like a control program. It puts so many susceptible alleles out there, it can actually reverse even from a high level. Can make the RL go extinct from a high level. But you have to make sure you get the right combination. The refuge and riddle release between them have to be good enough because there are scenarios where if you don't release enough riddle insects, it could just bring it down to a new lower equilibrium, which is still bad news. That's still above 0.5. So you're still um, losing crop. So do, have you ever thought of the scenario of releasing resistant lethal bugs? 
at that point. You've got terrible resistance to the population already. Yeah. Uh, lots of Bt corn in the landscape. If they were resistant, wouldn't they? Wouldn't their offspring they could make it worse. Yeah. Better? So our um, assumption is that those males that are released are are susceptible and have two copies. Mm -hmm. So that's going to require very good quality control. It doesn't necessarily need to know the mechanism of the resistance. You don't necessarily need to know the gene. You just have to be able to test that the, the, um, the core population that you're breeding up to release from you know, does die on a BT plant. So I meant intentionally release resistant males at that point. Intentionally? Because their offspring are carriers of a lethality gene. Is there enough benefit from that one more generation of lethality you might get out of the release? That oh, I see. Survive on BT would be right, so because they can live on BT as a sort of short lived. Because that's where the population is now. Yeah. So it looks to me like the susceptible, the refuge supplementation is a stronger effect in the lethality than what I'm mm. saying. Yeah, I guess I'm thinking from a regulatory point of view, arguing to release resistance insects, we'd have to be pretty persuasive, wouldn't we? <laughs> no, definitely not. Um, but yeah, so we're just releasing those sterile males at adults. They're not going to be feeding on the BT corn. It's just the, the progeny. It's the male progeny that are lasting. And they're not going to last a whole lot of generations. So if you only did that temporarily and then reverted back or, or stopped releasing at all or, or reverted back to the susceptible ones, you know, that, that I think the riddle allele is not going to last long in the population because it has a big fitness effect. I, I don't know how much the R would. If there was sense of dependence in the model, you might get a slight boost from that because you'd be pumping up density on the BT yeah. crop. Okay, that's interesting. <laughs> how am I doing for time? I'm too slow. Okay, um, so I, I didn't really want to present loads of data. I just wanted to give you a feel for what, what we saw. So maybe if I try and skip through this a bit quickly and you can slow me down if you want to. Um, high dose was a big assumption. I think somebody already mentioned that in, there are pests for which the toxins out in the field were not high dose. Um, and even um, back in the sort of mid-2000s, there was evidence, uh, particularly coming out of um, Bruce Tabashnik's lab, but other groups too, there were things where it wasn't a high dose. So these were a couple that we picked on at the time. Um, so uh, Helicoverpa zia, the data seemed to suggest there weren't even any fitness costs of this R allele, which is a bit scary. So there's no disadvantage on the refuge even. Um, you can see not all of the susceptible insects were being killed by the plants, even the uh, homozygous susceptible. And then almost as many heterozygotes were surviving as homozygote resistance. So we took that data and then we varied that middle value. So we had those fitness values and we we varied that from 0.1 up to the 0.404. That's the fitness, that, sorry, the dominance of resistance. Um, on the right-hand side here, the dominance of the fitness costs, we'd also assume that the fitness costs were recessive, and that's not necessarily the case. Again, here you can see um, on the refuge. Yeah. So we, again, took this real data, and then we varied that one number from, complete, from dominant to recessive. So this is the dominance of the resistance effectiveness. Um, the black line is the actual Zia data, and the other lines, as they get more solid, are increasing dominance. So as you'd expect, more dominant resistance spreads more quickly. Riddle release does slow it down, but the more dominant the resistance is, the harder Riddle finds it. And so it's like with the BT toxins, everything. And the more dominant the resistance, the harder it is to control. Um, so there are some riddle release ratios where uh, that's enough that it will ne the alley will never reach 0.5 pre frequency, so it's sort of going up to infinity here. And at this sort of top end of the scale, you're probably talking it's more like a suppression program than a, a, a resistance management program. Um, turning that around, it's just a different way of looking at that same data. What's the minimum refuge size needed to never hit 0.5 allele frequency with increasing release ratio? You know, up, up at high levels, it doesn't make much difference. But here, the more dominant resistance needs a bigger refuge alongside the riddle release. Um, and again, catching it earlier is better. Uh, so starting when the allele is still rarer. Um, 
in terms of just hypothetically where will that R allele eventually land up, not necessarily um, very quickly, but the eventual um, equilibrium, with no release, we picked an example where, yeah, it's, it was going to go to fixation. And then the assumption of being recessive, always down in that little corner, a lot of the early models sort of said it's recessive or nearly recessive, so we'll model that. We found some circumstances where there's this huge, big tipping point quite close to recessive. So it only has to be a little bit dominant, and suddenly, um, with a quite small riddle release even, there's a, you know, th there's a lot of resistance going to be around quite quickly. This 39% refuge was just what it was in Arkansas and Mississippi at the time, so um, that's why that's a, an, odd, an odd number. So yeah, is it going to spread how far? The higher the riddle release, um, the lower the equilibrium it's going to get to. But they have this very strong um, kind of cliff edges in places, um, threshold effects. So the same exercise for the dominance of the fitness costs. So this is the other way around. More dominant fitness costs means more of those resistant uh, heterozygotes are dying out anyway. So this is. Um, more dominant fitness cost needs less control. Um, at, and again, at the higher riddle release, it didn't make much effect. But at the low releases, you can see it spread across those um, values. The black line is the actual data for um, HR Megera. Uh, OK, so yeah, riddle releases could help the BT crops do their job in a wider range of scenarios than we first looked at. We're still not saying it's a silver bullet. We're thinking of this as part of a, an IPM, you know, it's part of an, an extra tool in the toolbox to deal with these pests. And maybe only used in certain circumstances. So perhaps there as an option for a medial once in a re resistance event has occurred, not necessarily as an ongoing. Um, and just as an aside, I've talked about BT crops, but we were thinking of this, we're pushing susceptibility alleles into the population. It could be susceptibility to anything. Um, so we went on to model, well, what about res resistance to that genetic lethal? And I'm not going to show you the results, but it's the same idea, except it's more complicated, because now the males we're release releasing, if we've got the quality control right, have two copies of susceptibility to the riddle genetic lethality, which will tend to dilute against any resistance. But there are also two copies of the lethal, which will tend to favor resistance. So it's a very complicated interplay between those factors. And um, we, we had a model to look at how that was going to work out. So that's Mike Bonzel, who's my PI, uh, people who worked on this paper and uh, probably haven't left any time for questions, but <laughs> happy to take some. <laughs>